All right, well, let's uh, go ahead and get started. This evening, uh, we're going to be looking at, uh, of course, the Great Awakening. And over the years, as you know, we've been looking at several things regarding the Reformation, uh, things that led up to it, uh, the Reformation itself, and, of course, the movements that have come out of the Reformation, one of which is the church that we're, we're in. And uh, we're looking at it because of how important it is to the church. It was really a time of revival, a time of restoration as the church moves back towards um, New Testament Christianity when it had fallen so far away. Now, uh, so far we've looked at several things. As I mentioned, we're going to do a very quick review. We've looked at the theology of the Reformation, the five points of Calvinism. I'm not going to necessarily repeat what those are, but would we'll refer you to the website. And we'd be here all night if I tried to review everything we've looked at in four, well, 13 years preceding this. We've looked at the five solas, and of course, the five points of Calvinism and the five solas remind us that the work of salvation, the work of justification, redemption, is entirely the work of the Lord. Uh, we don't contribute anything to it. God alone receives all the glory. As a matter of fact, that is what Finney uh, takes away from the Lord. That's what Charles, well, actually Charles, but John Wesley, although Charles may have been guilty of it as well, uh, was doing uh, by their theology to rob God of his glory, giving some credit to us for our salvation. Uh, top lady, as you know, was very critical of uh, uh, Wesley at that point. We also looked at uh, principles of biblical worship, at least what we call reformed worship, because the Reformation was also a return uh, to biblical worship. We took a look at the uh, pre-Reformation pre pre movement, excuse me, those persons and movements the Lord used leading up to the Reformation, and this certainly isn't by any means exhaustive, but we looked at the life of John Wycliffe, the effect of his teachings on John Huss, also the, uh, the Lollards who were ministers, basically preachers raised up by uh, Wycliffe to preach the gospel. That's what this is supposed to portray here. And also the Waldenses, which was a group, interestingly, that the Lord had raised up I believe prior to Wycliffe and uh, to the Lollards that were practicing New Testament Christianity and going about in pairs preaching the gospel when for the most part the gospel had been lost by the church. Uh, we also looked at the movements of mysticism and scholasticism, both of which were a strong influence on Martin Luther. Then of course we saw the uh, Reformation itself, its leading characters. Martin Luther, whom the Lord used to begin the Reformation. Uh, again, uh, we, I think we date the beginning of the Reformation when Luther nailed those 95 theses to the church door at, at Wittenberg, uh, calling for a public debate on the abuse of indulgences. At the time, Luther himself actually was not converted, uh, but it started a series of events, a, a chain reaction, as it were, that eventually brought Luther to faith and uh, a number of people also as well as the Reformation broke out. We also saw, of course, uh, Ulrich Zwingli and the Reformation in Switzerland. He's the gentleman here in the middle. And then John Calvin, who basically systematized the theology of the Reformation. And again, many people would criticize people who called themselves Calvinists as basically walking around behind John Calvin, holding onto his coattails and following him wherever he goes kind of thing. But we need to realize that we only follow John Calvin, or we, we only agree with him as far as he agrees with Scripture. And if you were to read his Institutes, you would find that this was not a novel idea. His ideas were not novel ideas in the, uh, six, or the, the 1500s. But rather, he was drawing upon the strong strands of tradition, theological tradition, throughout uh, the entire history of the church when he uh, brought together those elements into his, uh, well, into his systematic theology. And we also looked, of course, at uh, the more radical Reformation movements in the Anabaptists. Now, we also have been examining how the Reformation spread, how it spread to Scotland, and how the Lord used such men as George Wissert. Uh, I believe it, that was the year that uh, Dave Bush came down. And I believe did the whole series by himself. So we looked at uh, the beginnings of the Reformation in Scotland through Wissert, uh, Patrick Hamilton, and of course the very familiar John Knox, uh, the, uh, the movement called the Covenanters, the persecution that uh, they had to endure. But again, these times were times of revival and where God exerts his power to advance his kingdom. 
the enemy continues to exert his power to try to stop it. We then looked at the Reformation in England and how the Lord used Henry VIII basically to break the English church away from Rome just so he could uh, marry again and have an heir to his throne. So unwittingly, he became a, an agent of Reformation. Uh, William Tyndale, of course, who translated the scriptures into uh, English. Thomas Cranmer, who brought about Reformation in the English church. Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley, uh, both of whom were martyred for their faith under Mary, I believe. And then Edward VI and Elizabeth I. We saw how its influence continued to spread through England through the work of the Puritans and the uh, Westminster Assembly. Uh, we spent a couple of years, I believe, actually three years looking at the Puritans and uh, first couple of years looking at the Puritans in general and then the next year looking at particular Puritans um, such as Richard Sibbs and Jeremiah Burroughs there in the middle. Uh, sorry about the, the picture of Thomas Brooks. It was the best I could find. It looks like a newspaper clipping and some sort of kid's drawing. <laughs> Thomas Watson on the uh, bottom left, and John Bunyan. Then we took a, um, a year and we decided to um, look at the great hymn writers of the church that we might uh, uh, consider as those the Lord used to really take and put this theology uh, to music. And so Isaac Watts, uh, John Newton, Charles Wesley, and um, um, Horatius uh, Bonner. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, we also, at that particular time, uh, challenged the, uh, the, the then common belief within the church that we should sing only psalms. Interesting, we were talking about that a little bit earlier. Uh, and believe that the Lord would actually have us to sing hymns as well as psalms. Uh, otherwise, we would find ourselves in the, uh, the light of the New Covenant, of the New Testament, worshiping under the shadows of the Old Covenant and not being able to mention the name of Jesus, though we realize he is present in the Psalms, his name, uh, at least the one that we are most familiar with is, is not present there, at least um, well, a couple of them, of course. Now, last year, we began to look at the Great Awakening in England and considered the main characters in that movement, uh, George Whitfield, uh, John Wesley, who was a very uh, powerful uh, mover and organizer, as we uh, again saw last year. Uh, we looked at Augustus Toplady, who was uh, John Wesley's main adversary, you might say. And uh, we looked at Daniel Rollins. Again, top lady, I suppose, might best be known for his opposition to John Wesley, but um, uh, he did write some rather severe things. But the reason why he did it again was because he believed that John Wesley was robbing God of his glory. And actually, uh, we're going to see similar things in um, uh, Finney tonight, which is, uh, well, we'll... We'll deal with it when we get to him. Now this year we're going to be looking at the Great Awakening in New England. And we're not going to focus so much on the characters themselves, but we're going to focus this time on the revival. Uh, we're going to look at different aspects of revival. This evening we're going to be looking at what revivals are, uh, along with a brief history of revival, several things in scripture and throughout history that we should identify as revivals. Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at the revival of 1735, and actually a very interesting character who lived during that time, Phoebe Bartlett, who was uh, a very, very young girl who was converted and whose um, piety would, uh, I think we would find, would put us all to shame, her uh, zeal for the Lord. Just, it was an amazing time. We're going to be looking then the third week at the Great Awakening of 1740 to 43, that which is commonly called the Great Awakening. We're going to look the fourth week at the distinguishing marks of a true revival, uh, basically uh, surveying uh, Edward's work, uh, religious affections. The revival itself, as I said before, uh, every revival has its enemies. And the enemies try to discredit what's going on as being a genuine work of God. And certainly Edward's had his opponents. As he was trying to um, uh, defend and promote the revival, there were those who were saying this was really not a work of God but it was a work of the enemy. Now, Edwards believing that that was precariously close to the, uh, the unpardonable sin, uh, wrote the book Religious Affections actually to defend uh, the revival and points out in that book those uh, things that the Spirit of God does that only the Spirit of God can do and would do and that proves that, as a matter of fact, the revival did come from the Lord.
And then finally, we're going to look at what it is that we can do, at least uh, those responsibilities that are ours, to promote revival, um, looking basically at what they did in their day, in Edward's day, to try to, uh, to promote this. Now, um, let's begin then by defining what we mean by revival. And uh, when I say that word, I don't know if you recall last uh, Lord's Day, we had uh, Jonathan Merica here from the RCUS, and he was uh, um, preaching, for, well, uh, supplying the pulpit, I use that term, uh, because of Presbytery and so forth, and, and the session uh, gave me that, uh, that evening off. But one thing he began with, and it's interesting, the topic that he chose to, to bring to us was that of revival. And I wasn't even sure that he was, uh, uh, knew that we were planning on doing this. But he began by, by saying that um, uh, revival, though it may be a common term that we use, is one that, that he's really not so comfortable with. He believed it to be a biblical term, but uh, it's gained so many negative connotations uh, from others that he preferred to call it a visitation of the Lord, which is uh, what some of the writers actually use in the days of Edwards as well. As a matter of fact, I think we'll see an example of that uh, this evening. Now, the reason why the word revival has come to um, have so many negative uh, ideas connected to it is because of a movement called revivalism. So I think we should begin our study by trying to distinguish or distinguishing between the two, revival versus revivalism. And I think a simple definition of both would actually help here, and I've got two of them uh, on the screen. First of all, revivalism is man's attempt to bring about revival, while a true revival is something God sends sovereignly. Perhaps a better definition would be revivalism is man's attempt at spiritual renewal using the ordinary means that God has provided, but revival is God's blessing the use of these means in an extraordinary way to transform the church and society. Now, Ian Murray, I hope you're familiar with Ian Murray. He's written a number of wonderful books, and um, he has actually written a book on revival and revivalism that, um, as you can tell from its title, would be dealing with this subject. Well, he was interviewed on this particular point, and here's just a couple of summary statements that he makes. On the basis of such promises as that of Christ to be with us always, preachers believe that there would always be an ongoing work of grace in the churches, at some periods, however, the ingathering was large and sudden, and the name revival came into use, being understood as an exceptional work of the Spirit of God. But in the 19th century, a school of thought developed that believed revivals could be permanent if only the churches were faithful and used the right methods. The argument was that just as one individual is converted by accepting Christ, why cannot numbers be induced to accept him at the same time? According to this thinking, revivals occur in proportion to human effort. The mistake was to ignore that regeneration, change of nature, is the true cause, cause of conversion, and it is not within the ability of a speaker or hearer to determine when anyone passes from death to life. The church is to preach Christ, but he determines the increase. It was when this truth was ignored that methods to achieve conversions multiplied and revivalism was born. The controversy that followed was not between those for or against evangelism. It was about what evangelism really means. Men of outstanding stature opposed the new teaching when it entered in the 19th century, and their biographies are among the best in Christian literature. Now again, perhaps we can better understand what revivalism is by considering the thoughts of one of its leading proponents in the 19th century, and that would be Charles Grandison Finney. By the way, uh, <laughs> I don't know what you think about that picture. I, um, I didn't purposely pick it to uh, make him look as terrible. It's not like a political maneuver on my part. But uh, this is actually the best looking picture I could find. Um, I don't know what it is. There is a certain intensity about this, um, these eyes right here, very piercing. It doesn't look like a friendly character, but um, anyway, I'm, we'll, we'll just assume the best regarding him, that he meant well in what he was doing. But uh, actually, as his theology has been analyzed, uh, 
Some of you perhaps may be familiar with the terms, um, uh, you know, well, Calvinistic certainly, but uh, Augustinian or uh, Pelagian or semi-Pelagian. And in Augustine's view, salvation was entirely the work of God, although we disagree with Augustine. A couple of points regarding how that grace is actually given to us. Augustine believed it came through the sacraments. We don't believe that. We believe, or, or evangelicals, we believe it comes through the gospel. Pelagius believed that salvation was entirely the work of man, that Jesus gave us a good example, that his death on the cross and his work, his life, was not really necessary to save us. And then semi-Pelagianism, semi-Augustinianism is somewhere in between where it's part God and part man. Well, Finney has actually been characterized, maybe not even characterized, but uh, identified as Pelagian. He, uh, in essence, gives far too much uh, credit to, to man and perhaps lays it all on his shoulders. As a matter of fact, um, there are those who would certainly accuse him of that. Uh, the authors that um, Ian Murray was referring to were the ones that analyzed what he was saying and wrote against him. Uh, some of the great, what we would consider heroes of the faith. But here, Finney is actually a great example of this. And by the way, Finney is the father of modern evangelicalism and modern, uh, you might say, evangelism. There are so many people who follow his methodology. Majority of churches today, and perhaps you'll see some things familiar as we look at some of these quotes uh, regarding Finney. Now, the quotes that I have for him this evening come from the opening lecture of a series of lectures that he gave that were later published uh, under the title Lectures on Revivals of Religion, and it's considered to be a Christian classic. And in this uh, book, he gives us his basic premises. First of all, he tells us what revivals are not. He says they are not miracles. And what he means is that they are not supernatural interventions by God. As a matter of fact, it's just the normal operations of the way that God has made things to operate. Now, this is the first thing that he says here. A miracle has, generally, has been generally defined to be a divine interference, setting aside or suspending the laws of nature. It is not a miracle in this sense, that is, revival is not. All the laws of matter and mind remain in force. They are neither suspended nor set aside in a revival. It is not a miracle according to another definition of the term miracle, something above the powers of nature. Notice this underlined portion. There is nothing in religion beyond the ordinary powers of nature. That's a pretty startling statement. As a matter of fact, as we um, go further in to uh, revivals, and especially as we get to week four, the distinguishing marks uh, of a work of the Holy Spirit, we'll see that it has everything to do with God. It is a supernatural work. There is nothing ordinary about it. It consists entirely in the right exercise of the powers of nature. It is just that and nothing else. When mankind becomes religious, they are not enabled to put forth exertions which they were unable before to put forth. They only exert the powers they had before in a different way and use them for the glory of God. By the way, what he has said right there, I think every Arminian would agree with. That's nothing that's unusual today, although we disagree with that uh, interpretation. Thirdly, it's not a miracle or dependent on a miracle in any sense. It is, purely, it is a purely philosophical result of the right use of the constituted means, as much so as any other effect produced by the application of means. There may be a miracle among its antecedent causes, or there may not. The apostles employed miracles simply as a means by which they arrested attention to their message and established its divine authority. But the miracle was not the revival. The miracle was one thing. The revival that followed it was quite another thing. The revivals in the apostles' days were connected with miracles, but they were not miracles. I hope you can see what he's saying here, is that the miracles were done just to get their attention. And then the speaker basically using the means that God has ordained and because of their effects that they have upon people. Those were the things that actually brought about the revival. Nothing supernatural, but something that is quite ordinary, just simply stirring up what man is able to do on his own. You'd have to convince him of the truth. 
Now, does any mean by this that God isn't involved, isn't involved in revivals at any level? Well, actually, in some of the quotes we're going to look at next, it appears as though he says God is involved in this. Yes, we need God's blessing. But what he means by that is God has simply established certain rules or laws or principles in the universe, and things operate according to those principles, and he means nothing more. What he's talking about is ordinary providence, the way that things ordinarily work. There's nothing extraordinary uh, in a revival. God does nothing uh, special. So when Finney says that revivals don't take place without God's blessing, he simply means they won't happen without those blessings he has already given to man. Man's ability to be moved and to choose what is right. And he basically says that there's really no difference between the work of God in revival and that which is necessary to make plants grow. You know, the idea that when we plant something it grows, we understand that, that certainly God is at work there. But he's at work in the way he ordinarily works. Those are the, 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 uh, the usual basic principles of providence, we call them. Uh, we don't call them miracles because miracles is, is something extraordinary. But this is ordinary. Okay. So here, this is what he goes on to say. I said that a revival is the result of the right use of the appropriate means, the means which God has enjoined for the production of a revival doubtless have a natural tendency to produce a revival. Otherwise, God would not have enjoined them. But means, will not, well, excuse me, but means will not produce a revival, we all know, without the blessing of God. No more, excuse me, no more will grain, when it is sowed, produce a crop without the blessing of God. It is impossible for us to say that there is not as direct an influence or agency from God to produce a crop of grain as there is to produce a revival. Again, I want you to notice, yes, God is involved, but again, in a very ordinary way. What are the laws of nature according to which it is supposed that grain yields a crop? They are nothing but the constituted manner of the operations of God. In the Bible, the word of God is compared to grain, and preaching is compared to sowing seed, and the results to the springing up and growth of the crop. And the result is just as philosophical in the one case as in the other, and is as naturally connected with the cause. He's going to summarize here. I wish this idea to be impressed on all your minds, for there has been an idea, excuse me, there has long been an idea prevalent that promoting religion has something very peculiar in it. Not to be judged of by the ordinary rules of cause and effect, in short, that there is no connection of the means with the result and no tendency in the means to produce the effect. No doctrine is more dangerous than this to the prosperity of the church and nothing more absurd. Now, one thing we do need to understand here is that what he's referring to here with regard to uh, uh, that there's um, no connection of the means with the result, uh, he does seem to be addressing what we would call hyper-Calvinism. The idea that God's going to do what God's going to do, and it doesn't really matter what you and I do, we know that that isn't the case. We know the Bible says that if a person is going to be converted, we actually have to go out and preach the gospel to them. We have to bear witness to them. They have to see the gospel at work in our own lives if they're going to be converted. It's not going to happen out of the blue. Now, the, the funny thing, though, about this is, is that um, those who know the times and, and know something about Finney realize that Finney may have come across the idea of hyper-Calvinism, but it certainly wasn't prevalent in his day, and there was no reason for him to have to really take it on. So he's actually characterizing perhaps our view in this way, but this is not what we believe. We do believe that, that there is, well, there have to be, the means have to be used, but we still believe that um, God has to be in it in an extraordinary way if we're going to have a revival. Now again, the means would simply be repentance on the part of the church, prayer, uh, preaching of the word, witnessing evangelism, and so forth. Uh, so we believe, of course, there has to be the use of means if, if the Lord is going to accomplish anything. That's the reason why we are still on the earth and the Lord hasn't taken us to heaven. That's the reason why we don't just drop dead, as it were, when we're converted, because God still has a purpose for us. And our purpose is to glorify him, as we saw this morning, in the work of redemption by advancing the cause of Christ 
through the proclamation of the gospel. Now, not everything that Finney says is necessarily bad. There are some things which we can actually agree on as far as the conditions under which a revival may typically come and the results that it produces. He says, revival presupposes that the church is sunk down in a backslidden state. And a revival consists in the return of the church from her backslidings and in the conversion of sinners. Uh, one thing he didn't point out is it also has to do with awakening. Uh, after the great awakening is not the great conversion, as you know, but the great awakening is actually uh, where society as a whole was awakened to their, their danger and their need of Christ. Many people were converted, but many were awakened who weren't converted. He goes on to say that a revival always includes conviction of sin on the part of the church. Backslidden professors cannot wake up and begin right away in the service of God without deep searchings of heart. The fountains of sin need to be broken up. In a true revival, Christians are always brought under such convictions. They see their sins in such a light that often they find it impossible to maintain a hope of their acceptance with God. It does not always go to that extent, but there are always, in a genuine revival, deep convictions of sin and often cases of abandoning all hope. Now again, we may think uh, conviction of sin, well, we don't, think that here, but many churches today believe that conviction of sin is a bad thing. But it's not bad. It's actually good. And in revivals, the Lord does bring about a deep conviction. As a matter of fact, if you were to read the testimony of uh, George Whitfield, uh, before he was converted, he went through a very, very uh, deep a time of searching and fasting and seeking the Lord to the point where he almost uh, died. But he came through that time with such a, uh, a powerful conversion and assurance, and the Lord began to use him powerfully. So conviction is not a bad thing, even among those who are already converted. He says, backslidden Christians will be brought to repentance. Revival is nothing else than a new beginning of obedience to God. Just as in the case of a converted sinner, the first step is a deep repentance, a breaking down of heart, a getting down into the dust before God with deep humility and forsaking of sin. Christians will have their faith renewed. While they are in their backslidden state, they are blind to the state of sinners. Their hearts are, are as hard as marble. The truths of the Bible only appear like a dream. Actually, it seems to be describing an unconverted person. <laughs> they admit it to be all true. Their conscience and their judgment assent to it, but their faith does not see it standing out in bold relief in all the burning realities of eternity. But when they enter into a revival, they no longer see men as trees walking, but they see things in that strong light which will renew the love of God in their hearts. This will lead them to labor zealously to bring others to Him. Certainly we would agree with that. They will feel grieved that others do not love God when they love Him so much. And they will set themselves feelingly to per persuade their neighbors to give Him their hearts. So their love to men will be renewed. They will be filled with a tender and burning love for souls. They will have a longing desire for the salvation of the whole world. They will be in agony for individuals whom they want to have saved, their friends, relations, enemies. They will not only be urging them to give their hearts to God, but they will carry them to God in the arms of faith and with strong crying and tears beseech God to have mercy on them and save their souls from endless Burning. So as I read this, I, I'll, again, looking forward to the uh, testimony of Phoebe Bartlett, uh, something that was very, very strongly taking place in her own life. A revival breaks the power of the world and of sin over Christians. It brings them to such vantage ground that they get a fresh impulse towards heaven. They have a new foretaste of heaven and new desires after union to God and the charm of the world is broken and the power of sin overcome. Now, I think we can fault Finney there because the power of sin is never completely overcome, but certainly bondage to sin. Uh, Christians have to, to wrestle with sin uh, the rest of their lives. Uh, we, we actually studied Finney in um, our church history class in seminary. For some reason, the professor thought we'd never study Finney on our own, so he thought he would uh, teach us what, what Finney taught. He was actually right, so we ended up studying all these people that we really weren't that interested in. So it was an interesting class, but um, 
One thing that Finney said, which was remarkable, and that is a person is only just before God as long as he is living a perfect life. And if he steps off the line and sins in any way, he loses his justification and he needs to be saved again. You see, that's where his Pelagianism comes in. It's entirely up to you. But you see, on that definition, no one would ever be saved. No one is perfect. And I think perhaps this idea of the power of sin overcome well, sounds like a kind of perfectionism. But even for him, it's temporary because Christians can be lost. They can be saved one moment, lost the next, saved one moment, not lost the next. And that's the way it is with an Arminian view. Now he says, when the churches are thus awakened and reformed, the reformation and salvation of sinners will follow. Going through the same stages of conviction, repentance, and reformation, their hearts will be broken down and changed. Very often the most abandoned profligates are among the subjects, harlots and drunkards and infidels, and all sorts of abandoned characters are awakened and converted. The worst part of human society are softened and reclaimed and made to appear as lovely specimens of the beauty of holiness. Now again, there are things in what we've just read that we can agree with, uh, with regard to um, the idea of holiness, repentance, faith, and uh, renewal of life, breaking with the world, uh, uh, being freed, as it were, from at least bondage to sin, and a desire to reach out and to save the lost. But we do need to strongly disagree with Finney in his insistence that revivals can be created by using the means. Again, uh, earnest preaching of the gospel, bearing witness to your neighbors, um, uh, prayer, repentance, and so forth. Uh, these things are necessary, but he says that this is really all that is necessary. There is no need of any extraordinary intervention on God's part. So he basically creates a false dichotomy. We've already seen it. That revival either has everything to do with God or it has nothing to do with him outside of his ordinary way of working. Now here's where we, we get more of that. For a long time it was supposed by the church that a revival was a miracle. An interposition of divine power which they had nothing to do with and which they had no more agency in producing than they had in producing thunder or a storm of hail or an earthquake. Even in New England it has been supposed that revivals came just as showers do, sometimes in one town and sometimes in another, and that ministers and churches could do nothing more to produce them than they could to make showers of rain come on their own town when they are falling on a neighboring town. Mistaken notions concerning the sovereignty of God have greatly hindered revivals. Many people have supposed God's sovereignty to be something very different from what it is. They have supposed it to be such an arbitrary disposal of events, and particularly the gift of the Spirit, as precluded a rational employment of means for promoting a revival of religion. But there is no evidence from the Bible that God exercises any such sovereignty as that. There are no facts to prove it. But everything goes to show that God has connected means with the end through all the departments of his government, nature, and in grace. Again, we, we wouldn't question the idea of connection of means with God's ends, but he seems to leave no room for anything extraordinary on the part of God and we certainly would disagree with him that we would say that there's no use of the means in a revival. We're going to see uh, that those in New England, Jonathan Edwards and his correspondents, and again, there are many more people besides Edwards that were involved in the uh, revivals, certainly believed in the use of means and sought the Lord earnestly and fasted and prayed that God would send revival. But again, they focused on the one who could bring it. Again. Uh, Finney says, and yet some people are terribly alarmed at all direct efforts to promote a revival. And they cry out, you are trying to get up a revival in your own strength. Take care. You are interfering with the sovereignty of God. Better keep along in the usual course and let God give a revival when he thinks it is best. God is a sovereign and it is very wrong for you to attempt to get up a revival just because you think a revival is needed. This is just such preaching as the devil wants, and men cannot do the devil's work more effectually than by preaching up the sovereignty of God as a reason why we should not put forth efforts to produce a revival. 
to produce a revival. Again, it goes along with what we're talking about in Finney's theology. We can produce a revival by using the means. Now, to, uh, to summarize, Finney and the revivalists of his days were simply reacting against the idea that's, that revivals were sovereignly in God's hands apart from any use of any means, and we should simply wait for him to send a revival. They believed that revivals could and should be happening basically all the time through the means that God has appointed, and those means being, in Finney's theology, very animated and convicting declaration of God's word. He believed that really it was up to the, to the preacher to, to move men to bring them to Christ. Now, again, we would not disagree that that's necessary, that preaching that has no heart, uh, preaching that has no, no pathos, or no passion, is very likely not going to move anyone. And yet, on the other hand, uh, we've heard of examples such as in uh, Spurgeon's conversion that a person was simply reading a passage of scripture, although he did read it with heart, we have to give him that much, uh, was all that was necessary for the Lord to convert Charles Spurgeon. But again, the idea that it, it is brought about solely by the preaching or by the witnessing or by uh, our zeal is what revivalism is all about, that it has nothing to do with God, but everything to do with us. So we do agree that um, the means are absolutely necessary, the preaching of the word, the repentance, prayer, and evangelism. But we disagree that there must be, I mean, we, we believe there must be an extraordinary outpouring of the Spirit into the hearts of His people as well as on society as a whole before there's going to be a true revival. Now let's move on then from what, and again, revivalism, this, this is what a majority of, of evangelicals believe today, and it's actually also quite prevalent in the more charismatic end of things. Although a revival for them, and again, here's some of that baggage that uh, Jonathan Merrick was thinking about that's become attached to the word revival. The word revival for some of the more charismatic Pentecostal type churches simply means we're going to have a, a, a miracle meeting. Uh, we're going to get together and the Lord's going to heal us. And uh, it doesn't really, at least from my experience, because I came to the, that circuit, have much to do with a revival of holiness or of the conversion of anyone but it's mainly the increase of wealth and the increase of health. And we determine when it's going to be. We bring it about by, by the music we play and uh, you know, getting people whipped up, as it were, again, using Finney's idea, uh, getting people to become stirred emotionally and to use the ability or the power that they have to get that miracle or perhaps to be converted or you know, whatever it is you might be seeking from the Lord. It all has to do with the use of means. Now, what is a revival really? Well, it is a sovereign visitation of God that he does typically bring about through the means that he has appointed. J.I. Packer defines revival in this way. He says, revival I define as a work of God by his spirit through his word, here's the means, bringing the spiritually dead to living faith in Christ and renewing the inner life of Christians who have grown slack and sleepy. Again, we see this, uh, you know, this, this renewal of Christians, this, this idea of, of reviving of them. In revival, God makes old things new, giving new power to law and gospel. Again, here are means. And new spiritual awareness to those whose hearts and consciences had been blind, hard, and cold. Revival thus animates or reanimates churches and Christian groups to make a spiritual and moral impact on communities. God revives us in order that we may bring the gospel to others. It comprises an initial reviving followed by a maintained state of revivedness for as long as the visitation lasts. Now again, what he means here, of course, is that we're using the means and we're using them the way we ordinarily would use them in the church, in our worship services and so forth, or individually as we spend time with the Lord. But God visits us in an unusual way, in an extraordinary way, pouring out his spirit upon us, uh, giving us a spiritual boost, and he refreshes and revives us. And it's something that can be sustained 
for a period of time. We're going to see that there was a revival that lasted for about four years where that heightened uh, work of God's Spirit continued for quite some time. Now, Jonathan Edwards, in his sermon entitled Pressing into the Kingdom of God, which was written during the revival of 1735, calls that revival the time of God's mercy. He says, God hath his certain days or appointed season, seasons of the exercising both of mercy and judgment. There are some remarkable times of wrath laid out by God for his awful visitation and the executions of his anger, which times are called days of vengeance, wherein God will visit for sin. And so on the contrary, God has laid out in his sovereign counsel seasons of remarkable mercy, wherein he will manifest himself in the exercises of his grace um, and loving kindness more than at other times. Such times in scripture are called by way of eminency accepted times and days of salvation and also days of God's visitation because they are days wherein God will visit in a way of mercy. It is such a time now in this town. It is indeed a day of grace with us as long as we live in the world in the enjoyment of the means of grace Again, meaning, of course, word of God, prayer, and so forth. But such a time as this is especially and in a distinguishing manner a day of grace when conversion and salvation work is going on amongst us from Sabbath to Sabbath. And during the ordinary times, um, they might receive um, perhaps a, a person or two uh, a month into the communicant membership of the church, but during revivals, they would be receiving... Uh, uh, n numbers of people, I think perhaps on a monthly basis, it was more like 60 or more. Uh, we'll, we'll get perhaps more of that when we get into the revival. But again, one thing he brings out that we don't often think about, you know, we're often thinking about revivals, thinking about those seasons of mercy when God pours out of his spirit and brings many more people into his kingdom and refreshes his people. But we need to recognize that just as there are seasons of mercy, there are also seasons of vengeance. Uh, those are things that God also brings in his time upon a society uh, that is wicked, and certainly uh, we've seen some of those as well. <laughs> now, we've looked at revivalism, and we've seen what revival is, and we should really ask the question, what is the danger of revivalism? I think I've already mentioned uh, some of those things, but let's look at it a little more carefully. Uh, obviously, it's not biblical, but aren't people converted under this kind of thinking. And if people are converted, is there any reason why we should complain against it? Again, do the ends justify the means? Well, it is very likely that people are converted, but it's not because the people who are preaching have the right theology. I think we understand that. People are converted when the word of God is preached. Uh, the spirit of God can still work through somebody like Finney. He can work through, of course, people who believe that salvation ultimately is in the hands of those hearing the gospel rather than in the hands of God because it doesn't depend upon the beliefs or the faith of the one preaching. As a matter of fact, people who were uh, unconverted themselves, uh, who believe themselves to be converted perhaps because they were awakened and who had even devoted their lives to the work of God, there have been people like that, have preached and people have been converted. But it wasn't because of their life, their faith, or even their belief system. It was because they were preaching the word of God, and God can work through that. So certainly people are converted because the gospel is preached. So what is the, uh, the downside? Well, here's uh, at least three. For one, it does take glory away from God. Now again, we saw Finney give some credit to the Lord for um, uh, his institution of the ordinary means by which people can be converted and that God is working through those things, he does get some of the credit. But ultimately, the decision rests in man as to whether or not he's going to stir up his innate ability to trust in the Lord and to the degree that he has this part in salvation, he can take that much of the glory to himself. Now, that certainly, of course, uh, denies what the Bible says about our condition. The Bible does say that we are dead in trespass and sin if we are unconverted and we are completely unable to do anything pleasing to God. Those who are in the flesh 
cannot please God, the Bible says. And yet, wouldn't it be pleasing to God if you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus? That's certainly pleasing to him. But those who are in the flesh cannot please God. There is no one who seeks after God. There is not even one. The fact is, God must change our hearts first. And if we don't see that, then we take that glory away from God. That's, that is why Augustus Toplady, as we saw earlier, criticized John Wesley so severely, because he was taking that credit, that glory, that honor away from the Lord that the Lord deserved to have. And that's something that uh, you know, maybe, we, maybe we shouldn't get quite as agitated as um, Top Lady did, or maybe we should. We should certainly still love uh, those who are part of the body of Christ. And I do believe John Wesley was a true believer, though he was gravely mistaken on, on a number of points. But still, we do need to protect God's honor. And to do that, we do have to give God credit where credit is due. He is the one who changes hearts. He does it sovereignly. So ultimately, this view destroys salvation by grace through faith alone. I don't know if you, if you realize this, but that's what Arminianism does. Certainly, that's what Pelagianism does, which says it's all man. But even those views that say it's partly God and it's partly man. God provides the salvation. He offers the salvation. But man needs in his own power to receive it. In other words, the ultimate choice is yours. That destroys salvation by grace through faith alone because if it's, it, in order for it to be by grace alone, it has to be by faith alone. And even that faith has to be a gift from God, which as a matter of fact, the Bible says that it is. So the first danger of revivalism is it takes away from the glory of God. Secondly, I think you'll also have to recognize that it causes the church to look to itself or to look to man for the conversion or for that blessing of conversion, even for the blessing of revival, rather than looking to God for that blessing. You see, in Finney's view or in the view of the revivalists, we really don't need to pray for revival. We just simply need to get out there and begin using the means that God has given to us to convert individuals. And actually, we wouldn't do so bad if we would do that because that's what the Lord calls us to do is to get out there. But we do need to realize that God is the one who saves, so we do need to pray and recognize that. Now certainly, those that just simply get out there and believe that it's all up to them and they evangelize, they're still going to see some fruit from that because the gospel is being communicated and God can, simply work, can certainly work through that. But I do believe that God will receive more honor and I believe too will work more graciously if we look to him for the blessing rely entirely upon him and give him all the glory when he brings uh, souls to faith. So again, revivalism would have us look to ourselves or look to the ability that's inherent in man rather than to God. Thirdly, I believe it can also be the cause of some being lost forever. Because in Finney's view, basically, and, and in the view of many today, when you're evangelizing, you're simply trying to stir people up emotionally to make an emotional decision. A lot of it has to do with that appeal, you know, don't get lost, this is the day of salvation, come forward, pray the prayer. Now the problem with that is that to receive Jesus Christ as your savior through a prayer is, is not really going to work unless you actually do have saving faith or genuine faith, which is the gift of God. And some of the people who come forward actually do again, because God is gracious and he can save through the preaching of the gospel. But there are those who experience nothing more perhaps than an emotional response who think that they are saved. And they eventually fall away and they'll say something like this, there's really nothing more to, um, well, if there really is nothing more to Christianity than what I experienced, then there's really no sense in, in even trying to be a Christian. Uh, I've tried it, you see, and it doesn't work. Well, those are the people, of course, who were not genuinely converted. And if they think that that's all that Christianity is about, because that's what they've been told that Christianity is all about, then they're not going to try it anymore. And they may actually end up being lost on that account. Again, if, if they believe that's all that Christ has to offer, that's all that Christianity is about, they're, they're not going to seek anything more. But there is more, and we need to make sure we tell them that there is more.
You should never really tell anyone that they're a Christian just because they're concerned about the state of their soul or just because they pray to prayer. I mean, it's very common uh, in these evangelistic calls where after the gospel is preached, those of you who want to receive Christ come forward. Now pray this prayer. Now those of you who prayed that prayer and meant it, you were Christians, you were saved, you're, you're, you're never going to be lost. As a matter of fact, it's become, uh, well, quite common to believe and to say, well, I don't know if they'd say it so much, but they certainly teach it, maybe not to the people who've just come forward. But it doesn't really matter what you do from this point on. You can go back to the way you used to live. You can go back to your sins. You don't have to follow Christ. You don't have to repent. You don't have to do anything. You've trusted Christ. You're safe, and you're on your way to heaven. I think you can see how that would certainly condemn people to hell because they are not converted. The only evidence that a person is genuinely converted is when they have that testimony of a changed life, that they no longer hate the Lord and are disobeying Him, but now they love Him and they want to serve Him. So there's quite a bit of difference between these two methodologies, and we're going to see more about that on week four when we consider a, what a true work of the Spirit of God is, because it's a work that, that certainly is, is broad in that it's affecting a lot of people, but... They, those are the things that we should be experiencing if we are genuine believers. So these are the dangers of revivalism. It takes glory away from God, makes us look to man rather than to God for salvation, and can cause some people to fall away or actually to be lost forever because uh, they thought they were saved, and that's all there was to it. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at one further thing regarding revivals, and that's something that we saw this morning. And I just want to simply um, uh, do this briefly because uh, we did look at it in a little bit of detail this morning. Uh, regarding revivals, and that is that revivals are sent by God to promote the one thing that all of his work is basically focused on, and that is the work of redemption. As we saw this morning, that was really the reason behind everything that God created. He created the universe. He created the world. He created the world as a stage uh, for, oops, I think I did something I shouldn't have here. There we go. Yeah. He created the world as, as a stage upon which uh, redemption would be worked out. It's the reason why he created us. It's the reason why he sent his son into the world. It's the reason why he saved us is all because of this work of redemption, that God might glorify himself through the work of redemption and that he might glorify his son in the salvation of his people. Now, God has given us the work, as we saw this morning, of gathering in uh, those people that he intends to save. That what we, you know, what we saw this morning in John chapter 10 are called the sheep, the ones who hear the voice of Christ and the ones who follow him. The reason why God sends revival, of course, is to boost that work. Now, Jonathan Edwards believed that it was really the primary way that God advances the kingdom of heaven. The way that he brings the, the sheep of Christ in is through the work of revival. This is what he says. From the fall of man to our day, the work of redemption in its effect has mainly been carried on by remarkable communications of the Spirit of God. Though there be a more constant influence of God's Spirit, always in some degree attending His ordinances, yet the way in which the greatest things have been done towards carrying on this work always have been by remarkable effusions or outpourings at special seasons of mercy. So again, we, we did take a little bit of time to distinguish uh, revival from revivalism uh, we've also, uh, as just reminded uh, a moment ago, the, uh, the whole purpose of everything God is doing is to advance his kingdom. Revival is the primary means by which God actually carries us out by these remarkable outpourings of his spirit. And basically, in, um, in, in just to conclude this point, what we want to see is this, that revival, or that means by which God advances his kingdom, is a special season of God's mercy when he basically doesn't do, uh, he doesn't give us anything new as it were. We're still doing the things we were doing before. But God blesses those means even more powerfully 
and pours out his spirit in, in a greater measure or more powerfully uh, through those same means that he typically uses. Um, so in a certain sense, God's not really doing something new. He's just doing something more. He's doing something greater. And it is that greater part that uh, Finney seemed not to be able to, uh, to see. Now again, um, revival, if Jonathan Edwards is correct, then uh, basically uh, revival is um, God's way of advancing basically everything that he is after. And um, I think we can see as we survey the history of the church and as we uh, go all the way back into the Old Testament and in the New Testament that that is in fact the case. Certainly when a revival takes place, God is advancing his work. He is, he is moving things forward. And by the way, that's also the reason why we want to not only understand what revivals are and how they come, but why we want to seek after them. Now, I told you that in this particular lecture, we were going to look at two things, and we're going to have to go through this next point fairly quickly because we've already been at it for about an hour. And that is uh, a survey of some of those revivals that God did, in fact, bring. So let's just do that briefly. Now, in the Old Testament, there were certainly those special times that God poured out of his spirit to bring about repentance and to refresh his people and to get his people to repent and begin to move in the right direction again. Now, we do find, for instance, in the days before the flood, we read after the birth of Enosh, in Genesis 4.26, then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. There appears to have been a revival, and it's not uncommon that God will sometimes bring revival just before there are times of judgment, seasons of mercy before seasons of vengeance. And if we look actually through the Old Testament and see the great revivals that took place in Judah under certain kings, they typically did take place just before uh, great judgments came as the Lord perhaps was sifting his wheat and uh, winnowing, as it were, the chaff and then uh, burning the chaff up in the fires, as it were, of his judgment. But I think we can also characterize the time of Noah as uh, a time of revival. And by the way, we should also take, or think about this for a minute. When we go back into the Old Testament, we're not going to see, especially in the early days, uh, masses of people being revived because during those days God was working with relatively few people. Sometimes he was working with only one. You recall with regard to Noah that um, he was called the only righteous man living in those days. It appears as though the others were perhaps not even uh, converted at that point. And Noah was only converted by the grace of God. But it seems that when God would revive in those days, he did it by appearing to his servants, perhaps only individually, such as what he did with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and perhaps even with Moses, uh, when the Lord appeared to him and called him uh, to be the deliverer of his people. I think we would recognize the Exodus as a great revival, when the Lord uh, turned his people to him, and he certainly awakened a great number of them. But I think it's also a grand example of how during a revival there are going to be many people who aren't converted because the vast majority of those people brought by the Lord out of Egypt turned against the Lord in the wilderness uh, so many times that he finally condemned that whole generation of uh, fighting men to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until they had died off. So revival does not necessarily mean that everybody's going to be converted, but it does mean that at least for a time, they're all going to follow the Lord. I think during the time of the judges, when the Lord would, um, uh, well, when the people of God would turn away from the Lord and fall into sin, that God would bring a, a foreign army against them and oppress them. And then they called out to the Lord and God would raise up judges in those days. And as long as the judge lived, the people were revived and they followed the ways of the Lord, certainly under Othniel, Ehud, Deborah, Gideon, Abimelech, Jephthah, Samson, and even Samuel. And then during the time of the kings, David throughout his reign, God was reviving the people and they were walking in the ways of the Lord, at least until around the end of his life. And then during the time of Solomon, during the time of the building and the dedication of the temple, and for a while following, although we do see that he also declined. 
But under Asa and Jehoshaphat, under Jehoiada the priest, as long as he was alive, Joash certainly followed the ways of the Lord. Under Hezekiah and Josiah, there were great revivals in Israel where those uh, institutions that God had made, those, those ordinances were again followed. The Passover was celebrated. The people of God rejoiced in the Lord, and the Lord delivered them. Sometimes he brought revival through some of the prophets, such as Elijah, when Elijah defeated, by God's grace, the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Uh, the people turned for a while, and that was, of course, the ministry to the northern kingdom, which was essentially evil. But even during that time, the Lord would bring about some kind of revival, even among the people of Nineveh, when he sent Jonah to preach to them. There was one other example, or at least a couple of other examples in the Old Testament, that of Ezra and Nehemiah. Again, as uh, they were returning from captivity, there was a, a revival of God's people as they saw the walls being rebuilt and the temple being rebuilt and the, uh, the ordinances of the Lord restored. Again, we should see those as times of revival, certainly in the New Testament. The preaching of John the Baptist brought about revival and repentance. The ministry of Jesus and his disciples, certainly. The day of Pentecost is looked at as the paradigm of revival when many were awakened and converted. Philip's ministry in Samaria awakened a number of people, and certainly Peter's in Caesarea. And then Paul, on his three missionary journeys, seemed very much like uh, George Whitfield, and everywhere he went, God was blessing to awaken and to convert. And certainly throughout church history, now it's a little bit difficult in the ancient and medieval church to trace out any revivals because there was really a lot of uh, bad things happening during that time. But there were still certain lights, um, although I, if I were to ask you who these people are up here, you probably would never be able to guess, but this is uh, Athanasius, or at least it's supposed to be the one who defended the Trinity against, um, you know, the, uh, well, I forget the name of the individual now. Somebody must know it. Who was the one who was uh, saying, what's that? Arius. Arius, correct. Okay. Athanasius at, at one time was the only person who was defending the truth, but uh, there was... Um, Again, these shining lights, Ambrose was known as a great preacher, and of course, Augustine. They all had their faults, we know. Um, theology was, and biblical studies were basically in their infancy. There was a great uh, fall off from what we uh, had in the New Testament to what we actually uh, believed, at least what the church believed in the ancient and medieval church periods. But again, uh, there were those... Um, individuals that the Lord used to try at least to bring some kind of, well, to bring people back on track. Certainly, in the things that we saw in, in all these different studies we've been doing uh, during the Reformation series, uh, what the Lord did through Wycliffe, what he did through Huss, what he did through the Lollards, what he did through the Waldenses, those were all revivals. Certainly, what he did through Luther, uh, standing up and proclaiming the truth, and what he did through Zing Zwingli and Calvin, in Scotland, again, under Wissert, Hamilton, and Knox, and in England, under Henry and Tyndale, Cranmer, Latimer, Ridley, uh, Edward VI, Elizabeth I, what he did through the Puritans. These were all movements of revival. And then as we've been looking at the revivals of the 18th century, through such men as Whitfield, Wesley, Toplady, and Rollins. And of course, as we go through the series now, <laughs> Our focus is going to shift a little bit to, to New England. And again, Edwards is not the only person who was behind this revival. We, we saw last year that Whitfield and the Wesleys actually came uh, several times over to the colonies and preached. Wherever Whitfield went, revival broke out. Sometimes uh, Edwards would do some itinerary. And where he preached, uh, especially at Enfield, Connecticut, sinners in the hands of an angry God, it brought about uh, revival. But there were many other people, and perhaps we'll look at some of those as we consider the um, continuing reformation of the church in future series. But I wanted to conclude this particular study in this way. We, we know what revivals are now. They are sent by God, and we know why he sends them. He sends them to promote the work of redemption, that which everything he does is really uh, promoting. It's focused on. The question is, in light of what we've seen, is there anything that we can do to promote revival? And the answer to that is yes and no. 
Yes, in the sense that we should be doing everything we can uh, to revive ourselves using the means of grace. Uh, if you don't read the Bible, if you don't pray, if you don't go to church and worship, if you don't fellowship and so forth, you're going to find your heart becoming cold. And you're going to find yourself being drawn out by the world. The, the fires of your affection for God are going to burn low. But if you spend time doing those things, engaged in those things, you're going to find that the fires of your heart should be, should be warming and growing stronger. That is personal revival. And when you uh, reach that state, you're in a position to be able to help other people uh, find that same kind of revival. Your fellowship then will be, we might say, savory, uh, might be edifying, uh, certainly what others should be looking for. And also the Lord will be able to use you to evangelize other people. So that's something we ought always to be doing. That is always our responsibility to make sure that personally we are as, well, as, as godly as we can be. We're commanded by uh, Paul to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the way we do that, of course, is using the means of grace. But no, in the sense that we cannot move God to pour out his spirit upon others in society any more than he is pleased to do so now just because we're using the means. We can't force God's hands. The seasons of his extraordinary mercy are sovereignly in his hands. So we are to be praying as our Lord taught us to pray, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we must leave it in God's hands uh, to do it to that degree that is pleasing to him according to his plan to advance the kingdom of his son. So basically pray and look to the Lord's promise to bless his son by bringing in his people, but be willing to wait upon the Lord's time without becoming discouraged. Now this is something we're going to examine uh, you know, at the very end in, in much more detail because I do think there are a number of things we can be doing and should be doing in order to uh, glorify God and to promote uh, revival. But again, we do need to realize that ultimately it's in God's hands and not in our hands. Well, that's the, uh, the end of this particular lecture. If someone would get the lights, then we'll see if anyone has any questions. Ah, good. Anybody have any questions? Uh, you know what, I was going to put his dates on there and I didn't, but I believe, um, it, I believe he was born in the late 1700s and died somewhere in the, uh, the mid to late 1800s. So, yeah. so his ministry was 19th century. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I believe New York was one of the main areas of his ministry. Uh, there was a, I, was, I remember looking at a map and it showed what was called the Burned Over District. And uh, my, I didn't have time to research it out fully, but Finney's understanding of that, I think I had heard, at least th this is probably from an opponent of Finney, that um, it was called the Burned Over District because basically they had already done their method of evangelism through those areas and uh, so many people had, uh, had false conversion and turned away that there was really no longer any use of ministering there. But Finney had a different take on it. He said that so many people had been converted, there wasn't any more fuel for conversion. They had already, you know, it had been burned over in the sense that it's burned out. Everybody's converted, at least that are going to be converted. Yeah. Sarah? About what? About revival or revivalism? Oh, it was called the uh, Lectures on Revivals of Religion. You're welcome. That didn't actually get put up on the, on the board. It passed by with a lot of other information. Any other questions? Yes, Ty? Would it be appropriate for what? You said would that be considered appropriate for what? 
Well, the Lord does tell us that, you know, the harvest is great, the laborers are few, therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest that he may raise up laborers. I think that's something we need in any age. Um, is that to be seen as a part of revival? I think you said it, it isn't, but, um, and it may not necessarily be. That's the ordinary operations of the church, but we should certainly pray that the Lord would send revival along with those workers because then those workers will be able to do a lot more than they would otherwise be able to do. Uh, we do need to realize that during times of revival, we, we do, by God's grace, get a, uh, a boost. We get supercharged, as it were. I, I, think of, uh, I can't think of the exact name of the individual, but um, I do know that um, Martin Lloyd-Jones in his book, Preachers and Preaching, or something to that effect, uh, talked about a person who had been preaching for years and his ministry was basically at a certain level. One night he went to sleep and he woke up the next morning. He had become, as it were, a lion. Uh, his preaching was remarkable and people were being converted. His church swelled in numbers. And that was sustained for a period of time. And then another night uh, he went to bed and woke up the next morning just ordinary preacher again. And things just leveled off and tapered back to normal. Uh, that was, um, I think, a time of revival. At least that individual was revived, and the Lord used him to revive other individuals and to convert them. Uh, it, it's, it boosts that ministry, uh, the ministry of all of God's people, uh, which is, again, why it's something we should be seeking after, especially because uh, the Lord has called us to advance the kingdom of Christ. That's our job. You know, that's been entrusted to us as a church. Why wouldn't we want more power, uh, more ability to do those things? Certainly there's going to be greater responsibility, and there's going to be greater opposition, and it's not necessarily going to be a bed of roses, as I mentioned, but it certainly would be a, a wonderful time if your main desire is not your comfort, but rather is the advancement of God's kingdom. You really don't care so much about the opposition rather than uh, God is being glorified in the advancement of his kingdom. So, I, you know, that's what we ought to be seeking after. Any other um, questions? Did you guys get all the answers back there? Yeah, Sarah? Uh, oh, two, two principles of biblical worship? Well, let's see, the overarching one would be that we must only do what God commands in worship. That's, that's sort of the basic principle. And I don't know if, if what the author of, of that uh, quiz was looking for, but... Uh, okay, well, that certainly could be true. Or is true, that we must worship in spirit and in truth according to the Word of God. If we break down what it means to worship according to the Word of God, um, certainly it would include the Word of God, prayer, and and uh, singing of hymns and psalms and spiritual songs and so forth, and not, not using drama and various other things of that nature that aren't commanded by the Lord. Were there any other questions, or was that the only ones you were able to get? <laughs> I didn't, no, not, no, none of the titles of the lectures. We'd have to look that up online, I suppose. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, then uh, next week we are going to be uh, looking at the revival of 1735, and we're going to see what happens when the Lord pours out of his spirit in this way, how it just changes society and how Christians do get a spiritual boost and begin to live extraordinary lives, even as that one minister who began to preach like a lion. Uh, uh, God's people, all of them experience an elevated spirituality. And people are awakened in society who may not necessarily be converted but they become afraid of doing things that are wrong and they're afraid of God's judgment and so forth, so it causes them to reform. I mean, one thing that we're lacking as a nation is the fear of God. In revival, that fear of the Lord is restored 
and people begin to be very careful with the things they do. As a matter of fact, in Edward's day, it, it even closed down the, the taverns. He talked about how the young people uh, were no longer getting together and doing their, uh, their worldly things and their partying type of things, but basically began to attend church and become concerned for the state of their souls. Um, it's an amazing time. So we'll see some of those examples. Jonathan Edwards actually wrote an extended account of that revival for the benefit of Isaac Watts and John Geis. So we'll, we'll be looking at uh, different um, quotes uh, from that uh, next, next week. Let's see, in the last hundred years, when was the Welsh Revival? Yeah, if I had time, I was going to extend this history of revivals a little bit further, but I only tried to bring it up to where we were at. So, was the Welsh Revival around the 19, early 1900s? Now, there are many things that are being claimed of as, as revivals, uh, Toronto, Blessing, and all these different types of things. But um, we, we will have to um, uh, take what, what Edwards, for instance, says about the marks of a true revival and compare it, uh, whether or not uh, you know, laughing in the spirit or barking in the spirit or uh, things of that nature are really uh, works of the Holy Spirit or um, of some other force. Of course, you know where I stand on that. Uh, any other questions or comments? All right, then let's uh, take our hymnals and turn to hymn number 370.